uh, activist and community builder in the District of Columbia. With over 25 years of leadership experience and effective organizer ex and executive, uh, working directly with youth, elected officials, community leaders, and businesses. Uh, one of Mr. Um, Lane's uh, claims to fame is the uh, Youth Advisory Council and his role in bringing that into actual fruition, as well um, as he's organized and founded the Health Alliance Network, uh, AKA the Wards and Health Alliance Network, uh, one of the strongest and largest community uh, health advocacy groups in the city, um, advocating for residents of poor and low income communities, particularly in Ward 7, 5, and 8. And so what we're gonna do is go ahead and uh, turn it over to uh, Mr. Lane. All uh, right, Amber. Uh, William, and thank you, um, Carissa and Howard DC and, and Jillian for your work. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just kind of break things down in terms of uh, health equity and um, and the and the comp plan. Um, I also sit on the mayor's uh, commission for health equity. Uh, this is my. Uh, second appointment uh, uh, to the Commission on Health Equity. Um, so I'm going to just go ahead and start and, and, and thank you to the viewers um, and all of you that are participating foundation defines opportunity, moving obstacles to health determinants, including powerlessness and lack of access good jobs with fair pay, quality education and housing, safe environments and health care. These determinants are embodied in the living and working conditions of communities. The Health Alliance Network, DC's largest community-based health advocacy group, represented in policies and law and housing and through the district's rushed and ill-advised revisionism of the comprehensive plan, continuation of a general policy of benign neglect. Benign neglect, a phrase coined in the 60s and early 70s applicable to racist attitudes in the federal government, is, and I quote, an attitude or policy of ignoring and often, an often delicate or undesirable situation that one is held to be responsible for dealing with. This applies to multiple administration, mayors and council session periods where outright ignorance, neglect, indifference or band-aid fixes were brought to bear on the pervasive endemic issues of poverty, that is health, housing, homelessness, unemployment and underemployment and education. And now the coronavirus or COVID-19 is set to ravage through vulnerable communities, left vulnerable because of this benign neglect. 77% of COVID-19 deaths in the district are African Americans when we are only 46% of the population. Diabetes, a major risk factor for COVID-19, is at Ward 7 and 8 higher than almost all countries in the Western Hemisphere. Ward 8 is actually the highest, has the highest rate of diabetes in the whole hemisphere. More people die from cancer, another major risk factor, along with asthma, than any other cancer in D.C., and its highest prevalence is where, you guessed it, east of the river. Access to healthy food, restaurants, and typically well-documented markers for community health disparities and chronic disease, including obesity, diabetes, kidney and liver disease, hypertension, cancer, lung disease, and other disparities, all of which are COVID-19 risk factors. The DC Comprehensive Plan Revision, prematurely set in motion only to combat the increasing lawsuits by communities against the illegal and often unethical wrongdoing of developers, governs the living and working conditions or the built environment of communities. From actions from residents in Berry Farm, Brookland, Millen Park, Congress Heights, Greenleaf, and others, 
we have had to fight just to get the word equity in the framework element. The far northeast southeast area element covering Ward 7 and part of Ward 8 contains very little language addressing chronic disease, the living or built environment, let alone seeing through the prism of health equity, replacing the words provide additional facilities with encourage and support for continuing the policy of benign neglect, absolving district of any responsibility for the conditions it helped to create, but won't rightly end, which says, encourage and support additional facilities to meet the mental and physical needs of far Northeast and Southeast residents, including primary and urgent care facilities, youth development centers, nutrition and chronic disease treatment, family counseling, and drug abuse and alcohol treatment facilities. Now, what is particular about the difference between provide and encourage and support? I have a six-year-old, and when he does his math homework, I encourage him. I support him. I am not providing him anything. I'm just encouraging him. And when he does good and tries very hard, I hand clap and say, good job. But that doesn't mean that I'm providing him anything. In addition, in addition, and in conclusion, in order to realize true equity, the district must commit to major investment and resources along the lines of a Marshall Plan for the district's most marginalized and historically neglected communities, namely a commitment to building truly affordable housing and land value recapture, a healthcare workforce, built health infrastructure and health product manufacturing such as PPEs, systems change in education governance and LEA resourcing, a supplemental universal basic income, Medicare for all who want it, increased access to healthy food options through more grocery stores and restaurants, and many other proven equitable development policies that impact black and brown communities. We cannot continue to have benign Neglect. Thank you. Um, go ahead, elaborate if you, you you have anything. Well, I, I just think that we are seeing, in, in through the COVID emergency, we are seeing the gaps. We are seeing the the fissures and the holes in our healthcare uh, infrastructure. Uh, we are, and, and we're also seeing it manifest on communities of color. So, for example, um, we have been, the Health Alliance Network has been pushing for more demographic information, and I will say that the mayor has released more demographic information. We pushed for um, uh, more information inst instead of just uh, the age and gender, we pushed for how many of the COVID positive tests were African American. Uh, we, we asked for um, how many, uh, at least demographics by ward. And so that, that has been done, but there's still further information that needs to be uh, uh, released. So for example, there are other jurisdictions that are releasing information in terms of how many COVID deaths were people that had diabetes, how many COVID deaths were people that had lung cancer, how many COVID deaths were people that had other chronic disease and other health conditions. This information will actually help uh, those of us in the community that are doing organizing, that are doing outreach and education to be able to target. The other thing is that, that is needed is targeted testing. If we're not gonna do widespread testing, we need to do targeted testing. Targeted testing specifically at the nursing homes, senior facilities, um, so that we can rule out um, whole communities if need be. So we need to know where the deaths are occurring. So in other words, it's, it's good to know that you know, uh, a certain amount of the deaths are African-American or white or, or Latino, but we also need to know where those deaths are occurring. Right now, the rate of infection uh, is higher in Ward 7 than anywhere else in, in Ward 7 is poised to end up being the number one ward that has COVID infections overtaking Ward 4. Ward 4 now has the, not, the highest number of COVID infections. Um, and Ward 7 is soon to take over that at the rate of infection that is existing in Ward 7. So all of these things are governed and all of the background is governed by what we do in terms of economic development. 
um, how we build, how we build, and how often we build supermarkets and provide access to healthy food. All of these things are important factors, and many of these things are governed by the comprehensive plan. So I'm not one that believes that every every facet of the comprehensive plan is negative. It's not about that. It's about making sure that it has the things inside of it that protect communities and allow communities to have types of amenities and things they need so that it can be completely healthy. That's that's where I stand. Okay. Thank you. Um, I wanted to. Um, we're gonna move on and then we'll come back and 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 do some more. But of course, I neglected to introduce myself. So. Uh, my name is William Jordan, and I live in uh, Columbia Heights, um, up northwest. I used to be an ANC commissioner, as well a uh, PTA president. So in both roles, you kind of see on the ground the gap between what policy says and what reality is is producing. And so you know that's kind of my background and you know how I got here. Uh, so we're going to move on to Dr. Shaad. Chaad, uh, and have him to uh, I guess I should try to read his bio too, right? Well, I'll let him introduce himself. That's good. No worries. Hi, well, my name is Chand. Um, I am an immigrant who's been living and working. DC since 2012. I work as an internal medicine physician in the District of Columbia. Uh, I also try and organize to dismantle racialized capitalism that is uh, disposable. I would also like to say that I do work in a deeply dysfunctional health, uh, dare I say, healthcare system, uh, which is actually the microcosm of what health, what is wrong with our systems at large. Uh, I do not represent the place that I'm working for, my opinions mm -hmm. are my own thoughts. So you're I'm, gonna talk to us about the city's failure um, in recognizing the true magnitude of this COVID-19 situation, the lack of resources and all of those things. Um, so, so go ahead and kind of share with us and try to connect some of those dots between um, a press conference talking about what we have and an actual plan and actual functionality on the ground. Absolutely. I think if I were to start, I would say that most of this was actually preventable. And I think the data is now coming out that 90% of the deaths were preventable in the US. The failures were on multiple levels. And I think the first thing which we did or we didn't do was actually act very late. The DC government was extremely late. A small timeline would tell us first case happened January 21st. This was the first case of COVID in the US. January 31st is when the Human Health Services uh, declared a public emergency, a health emergency in the U.S. And then we have March 7th, which is the first case in D.C. And that was in Georgetown. And then March 11th is when um, our mayor announces a public health emergency. Right now, what we miss is that we went through entire February not actually taking any significant uh, actions. And in the meantime, uh, we didn't do any testing. Right, we didn't make any efforts to build a true public health system, and so these choices were made. You know, these choices were made, and we almost knew what needed to be done. Nobody can deny that we didn't have the information. To be honest, like it was happening around the world. Take, for example, Taiwan, a population of 24 million, right next to China. Right, so you would expect it to be the second biggest, um, you know, uh, center. But guess what? They had 30, 390 cases total, less than six around six deaths, and actually no new cases yesterday. So these choices were made, and this is what they've led to, right? Their weight will be measured in deaths, and deaths that I'll be caring for, uh, deaths that will be very sad and lonely. These patients are not um, close to their family members, and most of these could have been prevented. The first death actually happened on March 20th, right? Now that's less than a month away. Today we have around 2,666 cases, which we have diagnosed. We don't know how many infections there are, actually, and we've lost 91 people. 71 of them are black. So that's 78% of the deaths it has actually gone up since yesterday. Uh, and this is one of the highest uh, disparities in the country. 78% of these deaths are black. They're not black and brown. They're black, as somebody mentioned, right? So let that sink in. Right? What did we do to actually you know, talk about this? Well, the US Surgeon General actually came live on TV and asked black people to stop drinking and smoking. 
on one of the first conferences, the mayor actually came up and said that it's not a big difference. At that time, the percentage deaths of black people was only 56%. So that's like, you know, 46% population, 56% deaths, not a big deal. And then finally, later on said that, well, it's happening because there's more diabetes and hypertension and diseases in the groups. And as Ambrose actually mentioned, the, the real reason were the social determinants of health, right? It's that there's increased exposure. Uh, black people are working jobs and running the world and running DC more than other people. They are less paid, so they're disposable. There is poor housing, poor food, all those things. That's what studies show. 85% of your health is contributed by social determinants. It's not biology, it's not personal choices. And so systems and policies, um, you know, which specifically put black people in the city at risk for not only getting the disease, but when you get the disease, you're more likely to die from it, have led to where we are. Uh, what can we expect to see, right? I think we're going to probably see uh, black people dying at a higher rate as we move forward. Uh, we'll also see the prediction of total cases were somewhere around more than 1,000. Right now, the more than 1,000 actually means could be 10,000? Is it 20,000? Is it 5,000? Uh, so we don't know, right? And we have things that we can do. We can make this smaller or we can let this keep getting worse. It's still in our control. The other thing which we'll see is the shutdowns will try to be eased. We're gonna try and get back to the normal which got us here. I can tell you we're not ready. The WHO came up with six steps that we need to be. We don't even need the first one. We don't need any one of those steps. And what we're also gonna see is- we're going to see more. Could you quickly outline a couple of the, what those steps are? Absolutely, I think the first step was that the disease is under control. What, the, what that means is that the disease is that we are actually figured out that now the disease is only under some hotspots. Well, let me just tell you that we're not, we, we're not testing the way we should. The second thing is there is a public health infrastructure which can actually handle these diseases. We never had it. We're not even trying to build it right now. Uh, and the third thing was that the hospitals and other healthcare systems will be able to manage the cases where I think there's some plan there, but it's nearly not enough. And so there's other steps like this and we're nowhere close to it. And so, you know, just moving forward, I, I do still see that we need to really focus on the fact that what, what we can do right now, DC council and DC government still has a choice. We can still prevent these things. There are people on the ground, a lot of them are here, which are working right now, and we really need to be supporting them. We really need to be supporting the people on the ground right now. What we need is we need resources to be put where they're needed the most, right? So if you have a, a group which actually needs resources, needs extra help, they need to get uh, specific resources from that area. We need to start building a public health system, not just hospitals, right? Our hospitals are a mess. I work in one of them. I know exactly how they profit only money over people. We need public health systems. We need a public education campaign, which, was, which can fight the myth that was created that black people are actually immune, right? This, it's happening right now. Somebody on this call will be talking about it and that needs to be supported. We don't need I would say we don't just need like targeted testing now, we're beyond that. We actually need massive testing. If we had tested everyone or as many people, you test sick people, and then you test a random sample of asymptomatic people, you isolate the ones who are suspecting to have the disease and it, it's kind of controlled, it's controllable. It's been done around the world, right? So if we can do fair, fast, widespread testing, isolating the cases and tracing them in a humane and safe, secure manner, especially for the most vulnerable, we're not only flatten the curve, we're gonna shrink the curve. We shouldn't be okay with losing 4,000 people in the city. We should be shutting this down and that's actually possible. That is what all the data says. Uh, and finally, I'll say what we need is we need to house everyone. I think enough is enough at this point. We are really just, this is just straight up moving towards targeted deaths. Our jails are the epicenter of pandemics. The rate at which this disease is gonna kill people in jails is astounding. They need to be freed. There literally is no other option at this point. And we need the police on the streets. There's a public health hazard. There was a few cops in front of my house the other night. One of them was wearing a mask, which was here. No, the data shows there's enough disease in that community um, between the officers. It's just not safe for people and it never happens. Anyways, I'm gonna stop there. If I have more time, I can elaborate further. But I think that's what really we need to be doing now. Okay. Well, you know, before we move on, I really wanted to ask a couple quick questions. And this is to you also, uh, Ambrose. Is measuring the 
disease in terms of deaths and where it is by ward sufficient to understand what's really happening. So if the, if the data is telling me by ward, is that really helping me know and telling me anything of significant value? Yes and no. I would say yes and no. So in the sense of knowing where, so say for example, um, there, there are clusters and, and, and deaths are happening, say in a senior facility then you know that what you have to do is you have to look at testing that facility just like what we're not doing is testing in nursing homes um, that would present the city with the opportunity to to create a plan for either isolation and then tracking for those members that live in that facility um, most of those that are vulnerable live in either public housing live in low-income housing live in senior facilities or live in nursing homes. That is where the majority of vulnerable people are. And the only exception to that are people that are homeless. Um, and, and, and so, you know, I know that there's been, some, and, and then what, what Sean said, those that are incarcerated. So those are the areas where you're gonna find the higher concentrations of those that have COVID-19 and are, and are probably passing from COVID-19. What that also does is that if, if there are specific communities that have higher concentrations of those that have COVID-19, then maybe you need to look at additional things like, again, I believe in widespread testing. It's, even though I said we, if we're not gonna do widespread, we should do targeted, but we should truly be doing widespread testing. You're having drive-through widespread testing in other states. Why aren't we doing widespread drive-through testing? We're doing testing by um, getting your getting a doctor's note. The doctor gives you a note, and, and what we're finding in that in the states that have high rates of COVID-19, they are no longer testing mild cases. They're only testing cases that uh, where the symptoms are heavy, where they almost have to be intubated to a certain extent. We don't want to get to that point, and the only way that we can uh, get not get to that point is to is to provide widespread testing. And so we need to do this, particularly in communities that are more vulnerable. Now there, when I say targeted, yes, targeted in the sense of homes, uh, senior living facilities, but also a little bit wider in communities as a whole that are more vulnerable. And so, you know, if, if obesity is a, is a risk factor, and it is a risk factor, then why aren't we testing in communities that have higher rates of obesity? You know, these are- So, so Ambrose, I guess, so to me, it seems to be what you're saying is worldwide that the ward numbers are have of, of little value that that we know where we should be focused and it's not based on ward boundaries that we kind of in a in a position we already know the answer and, and I'll use the example of when I used to play sports. Uh, my coach used to say, you know, you play like you practice. Right. So if we've been practicing a certain way and then the game comes, COVID-19, you're going to go back to those habits that you've been practicing. So, you know, if we know that, and even the comprehensive plan, you know, it doesn't really speak in wards. It speaks in... Um, the mid-city element, and the this element, and the that element, and even the, there, it's broken down by the neighborhoods right. within those those you know within those elements. So it just seems to me that you know the ward number, and just from my own experience, that the ward number makes sense when we start talking about going to distribute resources politically right and so i guess ultimately that's going to matter Absolutely. but in terms of fighting the disease as an emergency and then fighting the disease as basically an expansion of a chronic disease so basically the path of COVID 19 is chronic disease chronic homelessness chronic um, incarceration. Yeah, incarceration. Mm -hmm. All of those things and 
as we relate that to the comprehensive plan, you know, most of the language or does the language plan even today speak to those vectors, those paths for anything, let alone, um, you know, COVID-19. Uh, Sha'ar, you have something to add? I, I would say that's why I said yes and no. Mm -hmm. uh, well, um, on the one hand, it does give us some data, which, which with we can act on, but you, you still have to dig even a little deeper beyond just the war data as well, particularly in terms of deaths. And that, that's yeah. where I'm at. You know, we, yeah. you know, we need to do more in terms of digging deeper to be able to create the plan that targets testing and targets isolation. Um, and I understand that the district is working with somewhere between five and seven hotels. I had put out uh, a, a meeting notice, but it talked about how the need for the use of the hotels is both for isolation, not just those who can, who can track COVID-19, but also for the health workers as well, to isolate the health workers as well. And so we, we know that there's more that can be done and should be done, we just gotta do it. Okay, I wanna ask one more question before we move on to the next set of panels, which will get more into housing and, those kind of things. Um, so who is responsible? So from two, two angles, and I actually, some people are on, but they're not, um, haven't been introduced yet, but if you have something to add, please signal and do. Who is responsible? So the chain of command for the health emergency. So I'll first stay there. Who's in charge? We know ultimately the mayor's in charge, but who is responsible specifically making the calls day to day for how our response is and how those responses, how we execute those responses? Who's responsible? So, so is there anyone else? There's a number of uh, points of contact. Um, DBH, Department of Behavioral Health, has a point of contact for those experience uh, behavioral health issues such as depression, uh, suicidal thoughts. Of well, I want to stop you there. Go to the top of the tree. Okay, so, so who's in command? Well, the top of the tree is certainly the, the mayor and her team. Uh, you have the director of health. You have who's uh, the director of health? Uh, Dr. Laquandra Nesbitt. You have the director of, of Department of Health. You have uh, uh, the, pers the person who is um, uh, over HACEMA, which is Homeland Security, um, and, and then you have uh, some, uh, the person that is over public, uh, public safety. So those generally are, are the ones that comprise the core of her team uh, that's talking about the COVID, the COVID virus. Um, and then you have the her agencies and you have the council as well. So, so, the, so the council is uh, passing, and, and, and I know that the chairman is on the line and he can speak to this, is passing legislation um, uh, to deal with this, uh, allocating uh, emergency dollars to be able to deal with certain aspects of this, such as the loss of revenue from business, such as unemployment and, and, and things of that nature, and the loss of income from that. Um, it, it's not so much on the health side that they're passing, legislation, um, and I'm not sure that that is within their purview, given that this is, this is a state of emergency and that the mayor has control over that. Um, I would certainly like the chairman to speak to that a little bit if he, if he can, but I, I do not get the sense that the, the, the council is directing the response in terms of the, the, the testing and those kinds of things. I think that those are in the purview of the mayor. Um, so that was to answer your question. Okay. All right, thank you. What I want to do is move to our uh, next panelist. I'm going to kind of skip the order a little bit and go to uh, Reese Cook. Um, I'm going to ask him to uh, introduce himself, give a little background, but first, so he's, his goal is to talk about um, gentrification, well, COVID-19 gentrification, the comp plan, and how the city's failure to address gentrification in the comp plan and policies have played out this particular uh, crisis and kind of share with us some of the things that are going on the ground to, I guess, counter and address the, um, the larger failures. So um, 
Mr. Cook. Good afternoon, everybody. It's um, good to be with you today. It's uh, definitely good to be with uh, DC Grassroots Planning Coalition Steering Committee. It's good to see all of you. It's been a while. Um, we've got to thank Empower DC for, for bringing all of us together uh, today to talk about you know, how do we move forward given um, all the challenges that we've had um, leading to this point and, and all the crises and all the, the isolation that everybody's experiencing and as well as the shortage of supplies and goods that, that the most marginalized um, in our city are experiencing. And, you know, when it comes to gentrification um, in, the, in the soft language in the comp plan uh, that addresses the, really, the, the terrible outcomes for the long-term traditional um, born and raised and long-term DC black residents here, um, it's, it's basically been a diffusion of the limited resources uh, uh, that we've seen for affordable housing and now for what we've seen for health and certainly the inequitable distribution of resources for our schools and for job training and job placement opportunities. Um, it's also a diffusion of, of the black political power, uh, the, the comp plan and, 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 and what, what impact gentrification has had upon the city specifically within the last 30 years. Um, the political access and the equal representation of, of the majority of black residents. Um, you know, gentrification as it pertains to, you know, the COVID-19 crisis, our current situation, you know, it's, it's, you would say it's strange, but just like you, you said, uh, William, you know, you, you're gonna play the game the same way you're gonna practice. And, and what we've seen um, during this, this COVID-19 crisis is, you know, the low wage workers who are predominantly black and brown have been tasked to um, be the ones responsible um, to handle the food and supply distribution. And all of them, the majority of them are untested. And they are tasked to come out in public and risk their lives, right, to a community, generally the same community of which they come from, the black community, the black and brown community, and risk their lives to provide the supports necessary for the people, uh, you know, in, direct, in the direct target zone of COVID-19 to support the people in need who are seeking um, food and supplies. And so we have two cohorts who are untested, um, two cohorts who come from the same community, um, two cohorts who are directly impacted by systemic racist nature of our healthcare system. And, and they, are the ones, um, they are the ones responsible to try to mitigate um, the suffering of the people who are most in need in the city. And, and that's a challenge. And, and, and I feel the city has been, the city leadership has been inadequate to address it directly. Um, they've been inadequate in their acknowledgement of that fact. Um, from what I see of, of the mayor's plan, of the city's plan, and please, if anyone I'm on this call or want to chat or watching on Facebook, if you can correct me, in my interpretation of the mayor's plan, as far as getting folks the necessary goods and services and, and food and supplies that they need. Her plan is to have poor people in need travel to food distribution or supply distribution centers, oftentimes schools, um, some, some of the nonprofits. But the, the poor folks are supposed to travel, which I thought was dangerous because isn't that the very intent of the stay at home order? So poor folks are supposed to travel without having any access to the PPE necessary uh, to at least travel um, in a protected way. Oftentimes because of gentrification and because of, of our, what I call our Jim Crow educational system, which creates the structural inequality within our school system where Poor communities have choices to, to travel to other communities to go to school because supposedly that would, that would provide better results. That's the story, at least. 
Um, so these these schools who are that are not in in the same communities that 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 these folks live in, they are now serving as food distribution centers. And the way that gentrification plays is that many of these schools that that many of of the poor black and brown students that they, where they go to are in highly gentrified neighborhoods and so they don't live in the same communities in which they go to school which makes them have to travel further to go to their school um, for food distribution and so this is how this is how the structural issue really comes to bear and so you're going to force people working for the school system and I bet you they're generally um, lower waged workers or people who certainly are not in the management level class um, serving the poor people who are coming up to the schools. Neither group have, have been tested and they're supposed to do this on a, I guess I'm assuming a daily basis, which puts everyone at risk, right? In order to get the goods and supplies necessary, the food necessary to survive. And this, what, this is what I see as the mayor's plan. We are on the ground with the Ward 6 mutual aid team as part of the citywide DC uh, mutual aid network. And thus far, I have some data because we, we've actually had time enough to collect that because unlike the mayor's office, we didn't start our hotline on Monday, uh, I believe, which was April 14th. We started back um, in uh, March 18th was our first day. And so far, we have received over 300 uh, phone calls from individuals needing support, food and supplies. We've had over 500 emails, okay? 4% of those were referrals that, that folks had, had um, received from other agencies, organizations, city council member offices. And, and since Monday, um, we've received approximately, this is just from Ward 6, the Ward 6 mutual aid hotline. We've received approximately six calls from the mayor's office, from the mayor's referral, um, from the mayor's hotline. So we received six calls since Monday uh, from, from folks who initially called the mayor's hotline number, our hotline number, because they were referred to us by the mayor's hotline workers. So with this data, what we've done is we have generally grassroots black led community organizations putting themselves at risk um, every day um, to help distribute food to the individuals who've called us um, to help be part of the food distribution um, within within in Ward 6 within most of the house projects and in mostly in the communities in which that have been highly gentrified within Ward 6. Because in Ward 6, the way it plays out is that, you know, you have the, the luxury condos right next to um, the marginalized poor black community. And they live literally on the block or around the corner. And so in, in our ward, it is almost, you can almost miss, miss the, the oppression and marginalization of, of these communities because of all the shiny new, new buildings and, and big development. And so what we do is we send our, our delivery folks out every day to be part of a um, delivery system that supports individuals who call and that also support um, these, these daily food distribution sites working within Greenleaf and Syfax and James Creek in Rosedale in, in what used to be Arthur Capper's, which is now called Navy Yard, the Hope Six Mixed Income Community. Um, over in Navy Yard. Um, we stretch all the way up to um, H Street, uh, Florida Avenue, which is Noma, the old Sersum Corda community, which was bulldozed due to gentrification. Um, we go up to Mineral, all the way up to Shaw, because, you know, Ward 6 is the largest geographical ward, and Ward 6 is the most populous ward. And uh, Maurice, yes, what I wanted to do, because you've, you've raised, you know, some of this, and I was looking at the um, comprehensive plan, the draft that the mayor and office of planning are put out, and they talk about the need, and one of the action steps is the need for community resilience hubs. 
um, to explore establishing these in um, communities. And ultimately, these hubs would be responsible for reliable food, social and health services, safety, and disaster recovery. And I guess what I'm hearing from you is that, you know, these structures exist, but they don't really exist. And that, uh, so part of what we need is, is the compre as the related to the comprehensive plan is this is one of those actions that we're seeing that um, need to need to occur, and uh, and basically you're describing you know how we've been uh, getting well, getting let, by. Let me chime in real quick, William, because I actually sit on the Resilience Hub Committee for Ward Seven, mm -hmm. and for the last eight months we have been sitting and designing what a community resilient resiliency hub should be. And we were at the point where we were choosing locations for where these resiliency hubs would take place. There's only resiliency hub committee and that's in Ward 7. And so um, we were at the point of choosing uh, where these hubs would be and trying to then find resourcing for them when COVID-19 hit. Interesting. All right. Um, so what I want to do is to move to um, our two other panelists, and then we're going to uh, move to the chairman, who uh, Chairman Mendelson, who I see is, is on board. Um, but first, I want to go ahead and get the uh, other two panelists in, and they're going to kind of deal with um, our homeless communities and some of the dynamics there around their needs and suggestions and ways to move forward in addressing that as it relates to uh, COVID-19. So I'm going to start with um, Reginald Black. Um, Reggie, can you come on and uh, introduce yourself a little and begin to share with us? Yes, uh, of course, I'm Reginald Black and I do a lot of work with homeless people um, in the city. Um, I'm actually a native Washingtonian myself and was homeless for like 10 years. Um, so I got a few things I want to show you in terms of homelessness um, in the city. So this is our point in time count, which talks about around 6,500 uh, individual households and families in the city, which, which represents a 5.5% change in the experience of homeless people um, in the city. This is a further survey that we conduct called PIT Plus, which indicates now that 42.1% of those people had a chronic health condition. All this data comes from uh, last year. While we were planning the Homeward DC 2.0 plan, we looked at about 10,000 uh, unique households, and that's minus youth, So that and that's through a year. So even though youth were not counted, households that needed services throughout the year was substantially higher than the one night count. Uh, what you see now is just how our like assessment numbers look. And this is actually from a quarterly report from 2018. Uh, you will see the highest number of singles is around 3,200. Um, and of those like 2,900 or so had at that point had to kind of like wait or not be matched to a resource. And you also see uh, the youth data there, which reflects the same numbers, 88 people total in the youth shelter and only 84 of them still um, without a resource. The last slide that I'm gonna show you, um, and we're gonna get into some, some you know, pretty pertinent things here, is how our housing system works right now. So it starts off with a triage assessment and evaluation. Then it either goes to a second assessment and evaluation, or at that time, um, a vital document collection and connections to income supports. Any of that second step can happen in any order. You could just go from triage assessment to document collection and income, or you could take the second assessment and then uh, conduct the uh, document collection and income collection. That process then moves into what is a case review and or a case conference. So for the time that you aren't matched, referring back to the uh, previous slide, it talks about 
how we take a look at the case and how we can get that person in line for the next available resource based on a certain criteria. If there is a tie in that criteria, we move to something called case conference. And that is where we pick a select number of people and we discuss their case further and they try to make a decision then. From there, you go into final uh, match to a resource, which includes a housing search and a final placement, which also pairs you with a certain provider. Um, so to date, uh, this process is currently suspended. So right now, people that are homeless have to remain homeless um, during for the duration of the public health emergency and to stay home order. To date, we have 88 confirmed cases in the homeless community, 262 people or so in quarantine. We have five deaths. And one disturbing thing that I found out of those 88 confirmed cases, 32 of them came out of the facility uh, creative community for nonviolence. One of the disadvantages that homeless people have is that with the stay home order and the um, kind of like arbitrary, um, um, I guess, policy of them remaining homeless is that they are primarily regulated to a congregate setting, a highly congregate setting. Some facilities have an excess of 300 to 400 people within them. Um, and they have to be there in that congregate setting without too much options of social distancing. So we have thought of a way to, to do that and start to reduce that population with a focus on people um, who are most vulnerable. And we get more intrusive into that because we want to be able to place those people securely, not in hotels and regulate them back to shelter. We actually want to get them into the substantial number of vacant units that are present in the city, according to the uh, say, um, there is about 10,000 vacant units in the District of Columbia as per their report. Um, I think this can be a way to address the emergency and then actually focus in our planning on how we are um, getting people into those units. Everybody says we need affordable housing, we need affordable housing, but I got you know a utilization rate from last year, 10,000 or so households, a point in time count that says that uh, 6,500 of those people are literally homeless and they got 10,000 vacancies just broadly in the city. And um, our, uh, our proposal actually takes a look at different ways to publicly finance uh, individuals and families so that they can said remain in some of those units and be able to um, start to restructure and rebuild their lives. Um, in terms of homelessness in the you know comprehensive plan, we talk about different things like affordable housing, public housing, and how we want to ensure that uh, public housing does not displace. And we have these different percentage numbers that talk about how much uh, affordable housing we don't want to lose, but we never start to talk about how much public housing we want to add how many units per like project should a uh, particular development be set aside for people who are just low income, for people returning out of homelessness. We don't really get as detailed as our proposal would go into and is as focused to um, help people be in a healthy setting. And I think if we implement our uh, our proposal to try to fill a majority of those 10,000 vacancies with people who are returning from homelessness, I think we um, will actually mitigate a lot of the spread of the coronavirus within the homeless community. Um, and then we can retroactive certain programs like, you know, permanent supportive housing and rapid rehousing um, to keep them in that for the long term. And I think that that is the way to go. But we should be um, requiring uh, folks that have taken advantage of certain finances um, on the legislative level in, in the form of tax abatements and tips and, you know, and PVs and low income tax credits and 9% credits and all of that. Um, we should be requiring that those folks now fill those vacancies that they have um, and they should be better serving the community anyway. 
This is what they indicate through their agreements. And to date, we haven't uh, used a clear mechanism to call for accountability on that. And I think that if we take those same formulas that we give to these big companies to subsidize their building costs, I think we can use some of that methodology to support individuals and families who are stuck in congregate settings right now. Thank you. Uh, we're going to go to, come back to you, but we're going to go to uh, Caitlin Kosilova and have her share um, a little bit. She is a, she have her introduce yourself, give your background. I'm going to be lazy and let you introduce yourself. <laughs> and uh, we'll pick up from there. Okay. Thanks, William. Hi, everyone. My name is Caitlin Kachalova. I'm an attorney at the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. I've been involved in the Grassroots Planning Coalition for three years now um, since the amendments began to happen, and we've been focusing on this for a while, often speaking in front of a group. I hope many of you are um, watching from home if you're able to. So like someone else said, you know, we miss kind of all being together in the room. But we're doing what we need to do. Um, I guess Reggie said a lot of the things that have been on my mind. This is, for me, it's very clear. So working, we are continuing to represent clients. The whole legal services system, as many of you know, and similar to many of you doing other work, has had to shift, obviously, to remote. So for us, we usually meet people where they are out in the community to have them come and get um, legal assistance from us. We're doing all that over the phone. We usually help try to monitor monitor what's going on inside of shelters or in the homeless community at encampments and stuff by going there. We can't do that. So a lot of the information that we're getting has, we've had to rely on the government to get that because we're just not allowed in those spaces. We've also been remaining connected with folks that we know who are inside of the shelters to the best of our ability and trying to maintain those contacts. Um, it's, it's clear what's needed. Like people are in congregate settings. We're not supposed to be they're gonna get sicker, they're gonna die, <laughs> period. And the majority of people who are experiencing homelessness in the city, in DC, are black. I know there was comments about the specific demographics. I don't know, it is definitely higher than 50%. I think it's closer to 80 or 90% of people in the district experiencing homelessness are black. Um, these are the same communities that are over and over again, as we've talked about, I mean, I'm gonna sound like broken record, we're all in tune with this stuff now. It's, these are the same communities over and over again that are harmed. So we can talk about it all day. We can lay out all the various ways that people are harmed constantly. We can lay out plans. That's what the comprehensive plan is. It is a plan. We've talked about this, you know, communities built this plan in order to protect themselves, to have something strong so that when their communities were being infringed on or were being displaced or were being separated, they had a way, they had a tool in order to fight back against that. And we saw that being broken down. I think, you know, we're seeing this with, in any strategy that's used, I think there's a lot of, obviously, there's sometimes thought that comes through it, there's sometimes um, planning that happens, but the reality is we need to be implementing these things tranquilly. We don't have time anymore. I think a lot of times we think that there is more time or we act like there is because those things aren't impacting everyone or at least not in the circles of folks who are making those decisions. Um, but the reality is, especially right now in this time of crisis, we don't have time. So we had a month, we had a month to like work stuff out in DC. People were trying to figure stuff out. All the agencies were working really, like it was a complete shift. And that's what we saw on the homeless services side too. So we've probably been working a little bit more closely with the government agencies than we usually would. We tend to be on the other side. Um, for me though now, it's a matter of, we need to start putting in actions in order to mitigate any more substantial harm that's gonna happen because if we don't do that, it's on all of us. I mean, what what's why wouldn't we make the decisions and take those actions now in order to prevent additional harm when we can do it. We have to know that we can do it. It's not that there's not smart people that are making these decisions or doing these things. It's that there's not the will or something. Um, there's additional pressures coming from the outside that is superseding human life. And in particular, people who are black, their lives. Um, and a lot of Latino brothers and sisters who are in our shelter systems too. And so we have to be implementing these things now. There has to be immediate steps to decongregate congregate settings, like Chan had said. So that's the jails, that's the shelters that we work in. That's even some of the encampments if people want, right? Like this is still like, it's not forced. 
it is still a choice, but we need to open up those choices for people to make themselves safe so that they have a place to go and they can survive this crisis. And then we put in the support system. We use the mutual aid networks and the infrastructure that the community had set up, that communities have already set up and have expanded ended that's how communities have survived because they haven't been supported by a lot of governmental systems in a sufficient way for a long time so we we figure out how all of these pieces come together and then we use that to protect people by placing them in these decongregate settings so it may mean that first we have to move them which is happening it's happening slowly though um, so we're moving people into some of the hotels but what happens after that because right now what's happening is people who are deemed vulnerable or if they're in quarantine because they may have come into contact with someone who um, tested positive, they're going into a quarantine setting and then once they're okay, they're being placed back. They're being placed back in a shelter. How is that allowed? Like that is not okay. And I, I don't know if people realize that that's happening. So I think it's on like sometimes for me because we're so in it, we have to take a step back and remember, like, it's not intuitive that these things would occur because it just seems so outlandish that that could even be proposed, that it would never happen, but that's what's happening. And so we need to be using all the tools that we have at our discretion to put people in a position where they are actually housed and not being put back into danger because post, I mean, even if a stay at home order gets lifted, that doesn't mean that COVID's gone. It doesn't mean the flu is gone. It doesn't mean that all of the other dangers that are um, inherent to living in these congregate settings again are just automatically gone. They are still there. People with compromised immune systems are always at danger when they're in shelter. Let's not forget that, okay? This is just exacerbating that. So when we put people back into those settings, we are making a deliberate decision about people's lives and that is unacceptable. We have a huge budget, which we can, we'll, we'll talk more about this and I'll, I'll let the um, chairman maybe speak to this a little bit too. But we have, you know, we have a very strong corporate lobby in the district. We know this. They just went and lobbied council the other day in a meeting asking for hundreds of millions of dollars in tax cuts. Okay, so we need to figure out if that's possible. We know that like communities don't have as much sway, unfortunately. We have to use alternative strategies to get that sway. So how do we even those odds? How do we balance that out? And how do we make sure that the needs are being met for the people who actually need things? Like we really need to define what a need is and what a want is. And so how do we make sure that people who have needs are actually getting those needs met? And like Reggie said, there are concrete ways to do this. We just have to choose to do it. Let's put our energy behind something that's productive and actually serving the needs of people who are otherwise going to die and their communities are going to be even more obliterated and even more you know, unsupported than they have been routinely in history. Thank you, Caitlin. Um, so we're going to uh, move into some questions, but we're gonna first ask uh, Chairman Mendelson to come on and um, you know, make his remarks. Um, he's heard some of the things, but to kind of let us know from the council's perspective, um, you know, where we are as a government, um, our political leadership, but then also ultimately, you know, I guess he's on point to connect big plans to little plans to actions on the ground. So hopefully he can give us some insight on how we begin this process of tying the big picture with the little picture to the micro picture. So, uh, Chairman Mendelson. Uh, thank you, uh, and thank you for inviting me. And also thank you for everybody who's participating or attending. Um, I was prepared to talk about the comprehensive plan itself in the process, so let me talk about that and then talk about what the council and the government's doing with regard to the public health emergency. Uh, as you know, the council adopted last year uh, the um, framework, revisions to the framework, uh, which is the introductory chapter of the comprehensive plan. And then in October, the Office of Planning released to the public for comment the remaining 24 chapters or elements of the comprehensive plan, about which there's been comment, and I believe that comment period ended roughly the end of January. The Office of Planning had indicated that they would submit the, um, their revisions, proposed revisions to the comprehensive plan 
this month. Uh, I had a conversation with the planning director a couple of weeks ago where he wanted to adhere to that schedule. I told him that I thought there was pros and cons to submitting the revised comprehensive plan at this time. But one of the advantages is that the council's not going to act on it right away, and so there's more time for the public to look at it and comment on it. So I do not know at this point whether, in fact, the comprehensive plan will be introduced this month by the executive of the Office of Planning. But I can tell you that the schedule, which I had hoped would be at least a hearing, if not several hearings before the council's recess, probably is not going to happen. Most likely is not going to happen. Uh, we have delayed our consideration of the budget. The mayor is supposed to submit the budget on May 6th. Originally, it was March 19th. In fact, uh, next week, I'm going to be proposing that that date be moved back another week, so we'll get the budget on May 12th. And that means we'll complete our work on the budget around July 14th. So we will not be dealing with a comprehensive plan before July 14th. Um, that means the earliest we would have hearings, and I haven't decided how many hearings, but I'm mindful that we don't want one hearing with 150 witnesses. The earliest we could have hearings would be in the fall. So there will be plenty of time for folks to look at the plan. Now, there were some comments by panelists with regard to what the comprehensive plan could do regarding this public health emergency. I'm not sure about that, but I'm certainly open to comments. There's nothing the plan can do about the emergency today, but a future emergency. The, although the plan speaks to many different public policy issues, such as health, transportation, urban design, housing, and so forth, really the part of the plan that is the most effective because it has some binding authority is the land use element. And that is really where we want to see density and what kinds of development in the sense of housing versus commercial versus industrial. And uh, that, that, that's really what the plan does. And although um, uh, oftentimes the advantage of comments that I hear is to see things from a perspective that I wouldn't otherwise, I don't know how the comprehensive plan is the place to address a public health emergency. Now, let me talk about the, um, a few things with regard to the pandemic and the public health emergency. Uh, quite a few folks talked about strategies to help with the spread of the virus and the need for testing. Um, I would agree with anybody who would say that the district government has not tested enough. But anybody who suggests that the district is an outlier in this country with regard to testing has not been paying attention to the national news. Every state is struggling to get enough testing. I did a rough calculation on how many individuals have been tested in the district, a percentage of the number tested to the uh, total population of the district. It's about 1.8%. That's pathetic. The national average is about 1%. That's more pathetic. Uh, when we talk about uh, populations uh, such as those in jail or homeless shelters, uh, absolutely, I think testing everybody is an important strategy. Uh, if we wait until the incidence of virus is great enough that it is an uncontrollable community spread within those uh, in environments, uh, we're going to be very much on a defensive and uh, there is no easy solution then. There is no easy solution then. Uh, I have pressed the mayor uh, about uh, testing. Um, the materials on hand for testing if I remember correctly, are about uh, 2,000, a little over 2,000 uh, case individuals could be tested. That's pretty pathetic. Um, the city relies on the federal government for materials. The city is out competing with other states for materials. There is nobody that says that they have enough materials, whether we're talking about the reagent or we're talking about the swabs or we're talking about the testing um, um, machines. Um, it's a real crisis and it is handicapping us in terms of being able to protect individuals as well as um, uh, our moving toward people being able to um, get back to work and a more normal life. Now with regard to what the council's doing, 
The uh, public health emergency, an emergency by its nature, gives more authority to the mayor. Uh, we are trying to work closely with the mayor. Uh, really what the council's been doing is looking for where there are places in the law where we can make changes uh, to facilitate actions to help with the public health emergency. So um, the council's met twice and adopted legislation, emergency legislation, uh, to expand access to unemployment, to help with businesses that are closed, to uh, strengthen some protections with regard to um, consumer protection. Um, an issue that came to my attention this past week, but I don't think we're quite ready to act on it, is whether there are some barriers, regulatory barriers, to allow more folks who are trained but are not yet licensed to help uh, as a healthcare provider to be able to get into um, the, the facilities to help with um, healthcare. Uh, these are the kinds of things that the council can do. Um, but a, a lot of what we're looking for in terms of decisions about the uh, lockdown, um, the priorities with regard to testing with the limited materials we have, uh, preparing for the surge capacity uh, on the mayor's side. Um, to say a little bit more about surge capacity, and really that's what this uh, emergency is about, is that um, there will be a percentage of people who, who uh, are infected who will require hospitalization. It's really not a, a huge percentage of the people who probably have been infected, but it's too huge a percentage for our hospitals to be able to handle. And so this is really all about surge capacity. Uh, roughly, according to the mayor's estimates, we need a doubling of the number of beds, hospital beds that are available and um, in substantial increase in related equipment such as ventilators. Uh, my impression is that uh, the mayor is well on, on her way, or the government is well on its way toward meeting that capacity, except with regard to materials such as PPE. Uh, PPE is the personal protective equipment. There was a statistic that I remember uh, because it was just so huge uh, from the mayor's presentation on April 3rd with regard to what materials were needed. Just as an example, gloves, plastic gloves, or latex gloves, 40 million pairs, 40 million pairs. And we're out in the market competing with other states who have a shortage as well. So I guess in a word or two, I would say that the, um, this uh, public health emergency is a mess, uh, but this is not a mess where the district has uh, created this problem by itself. Uh, could we be doing some things better? Yes. Are there, um, are there uh, actions that you could point to that are, have been um, woefully inadequate? Yes, but those are actions such as testing where um, it's, it's really not the district. It's, uh, I would say, the um, national strategy for dealing with this. I've covered a bunch of things. I think uh, you questions, so why don't I stop? Yeah, so Chairman, so one of the things that uh, I'm gonna open up with a couple questions, but then we're gonna allow the panel to to also ask a few questions. Um, you know, back on January, back in January of this year, um, the OCFO and I think the mayor and yourself were celebrating that we had um, maxed or reached our rainy day fund um, capacity, I guess of. 1.43 billion. Uh, we were talking about a budget surplus of close to $323 million back then. And of course, implied in that was our AAA bond rating. And that we had as a, you know, through our growth and through everything, which is kind of managed by the comp plan and land use, we, I guess we were in Nirvana. We had reached you know, some of, some of the pinnacle of our, of our goals. Uh, three months later, there's a, the mayor's on Fox News um, highlighting the um, disparity in health among African Americans, and she's referring to slavery, racism, and Jim Crow. So I guess kind of connecting the plans with, you know, with, with reality, you know, if the, district has reached its sort of 
Financial Health Zenith in January, and we were celebrating the virus comes and it exposes that that infrastructure and everything we thought was in place maybe really wasn't in an equitable way in place. You know, there seems to be a disconnect. Am I wrong in seeing that we're we were celebrating, but maybe we were celebrating something false? Is there an implication that we didn't do some things in order to meet our financial goals or Am I reading too much into, into that we were celebrating and now we're in a crisis um, with business groups asking for bailouts? Uh, well, there are to answer that, but I would say in a word, yes, wrong. Um, if, because I think the premise to your question that I, I, I think is not quite right. If what you're asking about is we were celebrating that everything was perfect in the district. I don't think we were celebrating that everything in the district was perfect. And what we're seeing with this public health crisis is in fact uh, the flaws, the woeful inadequacy of the public health in the district. I don't know that I would say we were celebrating in January, but what was the good news in January was that from a financial perspective, the district government was healthy. The fact that we were healthy puts us in a position where we may be able to get through this crisis alive. There are probably states and cities that will go bankrupt or are on the verge of bankruptcy. We are probably not on the verge of bankruptcy. Our reserves, which were built up, are now being depleted. We have taken enough money out of our reserves that we've had to authorize the chief financial officer to do short-term borrowing of a half a billion dollars later this summer. A half a billion dollars, which we haven't borrowed in a very long time. That's because we are running down our reserves. I don't want to suggest they're running down to zero, but they are running down to a point where they will not be at 60 days. They may not be at 50 days. Uh, we have a ca serious cash flow problem later this summer. Um, and so I would say that the financial health in January was a good thing because it's available to help us now. But the financial health in January doesn't speak to everything about the district. And the everything includes whether we have disparities in the public health, and we do, inequities in the public health, we do. A uh, high instance of incidence of poverty, we do. Nobody was suggesting in January that those were solved. There was hope that with the surplus, that we would be able to do more with regard to addressing social justice issues. At this point, we are having to do more to just help the, I'm trying to remember, um, the 55, 60,000 people who filed for unemployment so far. And the, the, the hundreds or thousands of businesses who employ folks who right now are shuttered and are unable to um, employ anybody. So, okay, and I guess I would flip it and then say, and, and again, if we, instead of putting so much in a rainy day fund and had borrowed 500 million to invest in the disparities, maybe we wouldn't have the level of emergency we have today. I don't agree. I but don't I mean, agree. I, I think that is, but I think that is my question. That my question is, 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 is that very thing is, I guess it's almost a zero sum, is that we could have invested in one set of things to, I guess the curve we could have been was the poverty curve, right? So there's a, there was an inequity curve and maybe we should have been focused on bending the inequity curve instead of bending the health curve now because they seem to have both been connected. I think that's what our panelists said earlier. The chronic health problems, and the chronic housing problems that existed is what makes COVID-19 so dangerous today. And so I guess with the comp plan and all these big picture things, I guess that's that is at the heart of our question 
both to you, to ourselves, and, and to the mayor, is are we bending a curve now because we failed to bend the curve earlier, or am I going too far? In I think I'm going, too far. I'm going too far. This, this situation of the district with the um, coronavirus is arguably better than in some urban centers. New York City region has been the worst and maybe the worst in the world in terms of the number of deaths and the, uh, the number, the percentage that's been infected. Um, so to suggest that somehow we um, didn't do enough earlier, and that's why this, the effect of this pandemic is worse in Washington, D.C., I think you would have to take that criticism to the entire country. And, and maybe, I guess if I think about it, really what we're talking about is poverty and that so many of the uh, negative issues that come out of poverty, such as uh, poor uh, health. And um, you know, maybe if we had uh, solved poverty in the district uh, before this, in, in this pandemic, um, but that's tough. And uh, I can't, I would argue, I would disagree that we have done a worse job than other cities. And uh, I don't think I argue about, you know, I'm going to let the panelists ask questions, but of course, I don't live in New York. My, my focus is on what we can do within Washington, D.C., what we do with our resources. And yes, we can compare to other places to see relatively how we're doing. But I do think that there's, you know, there's something that we are missing. Maybe we need to have a, when we say we have a AAA bond rating with Wall Street, we need to say we have a C rating with equity uh, internally so that we know and we're measuring in a fair way. But I think- um, and Well, that may be true. That may be true. But uh, are we, and I don't want to say, well, that's okay because uh, we're no worse than any place else, but there's a there's an implication in what you're saying, which is that we've been doing nothing. So what have we done in the area before? Well, I, I would never say nothing. I think I think, I think we're talking about more in affordable housing than any other city on a per capita basis. Right, but we need more affordable housing than any other city on That's a per capita on a per capita basis. So, uh, but I'll let go to um, uh, yeah. Ambrose Lane. I think he has a, a question for you. It, it's, it's, it's not so much a question. I, I don't think that it's, uh, I think it's a false choice, to be honest with you. I, I think the aspects of what both of you have said are, have been right. So let, let's just, when we look at cities this size um, and COVID-19, we actually have relatively low number of deaths. That, that's, that's a fact. The issue is not, but the issue is prevention. Could you ask the question, William, could some of this have been prevented? I would say some of it could have been prevented. But COVID, the way that COVID operates, it could not have been totally prevented. I do think that the city does need to do a better job of investing in health infrastructure health workforce, which it does not do. Um, so, so just to give a, a typical example, the, the mayor has her um, uh, core, her, her, her core, the, you know, and these are, some people are people that came from health backgrounds, but some people are just volunteers. But that does not substitute for a trained health workforce. That can actually happen through council action in terms of um, a state plan amendment to Medicaid that can actually pay people to engage in health services and, and, and careers. Um, it can happen through the 1115 waiver. It can happen uh, by investment through DSLVD. There are a number of different ways that the district can invest in a healthcare workforce and a health care infrastructure. And I mean, I mean by healthcare infrastructure, having the actual bricks and mortar of what a healthcare infrastructure actually means. The district does not do enough of that. 
That's number one. The second thing is that, you know, the mayor right now has what's called her district economic recovery team that is led by uh, the, the uh, deputy mayor, for, Econo deputy mayor for, for planning and economic development. I had asked uh, Chairman Gray whether or not there is input from people who are not developers, people who are community, um, people who do development or are, have expertise or have an acuity to development to be a part of that. Because my concern is, is, is what's going to happen after this is over. If I, as a parent, have a child and I feed that child nothing but fast food and that child gets sick, I'm, my job as a parent is to nurse that child to health first. But then after that child is nursed to health, if I go back to feeding that child fast food, then that is on me as a parent. And it's the same thing with the city. We now see the fissures and the gaps that exist in healthcare among poor people and among marginalized communities. So now that we see it, the issue is going to be after this COVID virus is over, and it will be over, we don't know exactly when, what is the city going to do? Not just the council, not just the mayor, what is the city going to do so that in the future we are investing in chronic disease management, we are investing in food, in, in food deserts, we are investing in the, in the very things that cause high levels of chronic disease to bring down those levels of chronic disease so that the next time this happens, there won't be so many people that are vulnerable. Now, structurally, we can sit here and say that there are 70, 70 odd, 70 plus, 77, 75 senior independent living facilities. Those are congregated people that are seniors. Some of them do have seniors and others, but they're mainly seniors. I don't know whether or not, uh, if COVID happens again, there is a plan to be able to isolate or test or make sure that those seniors are safe. But we do have a health, we, have, we could create a health workforce that could be able to go into those buildings, be able to do some of those things, just like we now have a, a whole plethora, if you go on the COVID DC website, a whole plethora of where people can get access to food. But even on that website, the COVID DC website, you look at food distribution, you find disparities even in the COVID-19 food distribution in terms of where people can pick up free food, in terms of where food is distributed. There is a disparity on the actual GIS map in terms of picking up food or availability of free food. If you look at Ward 1 and Ward 2 and, and part of Ward 6, you have a whole bunch of places that you can pick up food. But in Ward 7 and 8, you have very few places that you can pick up food. That speaks to the, the, the lack of investment in the infrastructure of food and availability of fresh, of, of, of healthy food. So there's a number oh, of- Ambrose, I'm gonna uh, hold that for a point. No, 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 no. Uh, I wanna add, let uh, Maurice ask a question and then we'll go back to the uh, chairman if he has a comment. Yeah. Ambrose, thank you for bringing that, that point up about the disparity in the response to COVID-19 um, regarding the infrastructure that has been put in place uh, to support those most in need. A, it's, it, it specifically ties to the issue with the comp plan and gentrification. And this 30 year, 30, almost 40 year uh, plan that we have been on of reallocating resources west of the river and stealing away resources east of the river. And that is structural and it has nothing to do with COVID-19. COVID-19 is just highlighting um, the practice that, Reggie, uh, that William referred to earlier. Now that we're in the game, we've been practicing um, up to this level of disparity. And I, I would ask the chairman, um, sir, we, we need your support. We are sending um, we are sending people who are willing to risk their lives every day into the the communities that are under the most risk. And they happen to be from the very same community. And in order to get the resources they need, they have to travel. And so in Ward 6, we, we've built 
an infrastructure where we're trying to limit the amount of travel that people are doing with the Ward 6 mutual aid team. And we, are, we have to support families, not only with food and, and cleaning supplies and, and as much PPE as we can get our hands on, sir, we have to start a public health campaign and we've done that. We're working with doctors and some artists, and we're designing content to, to deliver directly to the communities that need this information, this educational access and, and, and health that they need immediately, right now, not while the, the, the council and the mayor discuss, debate, determine what are the best ways to move forward. They, folks need masks. They need to know the severity of the situation right now. Um, we also are trying to provide laptops in and, 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 and so let me just take my question. Let me just my question. What are you willing to do today? What are you willing to commit today that we can have in our hands tomorrow when we go down into these communities? We need support from the council and the mayor right now today. Well, um, I don't want to sound like I'm passing the buck, but a lot in terms of what is provided is done by the mayor and not by the council. The council does legislation. With regard to, uh, you mentioned masks, w what are we willing to provide? There are not enough masks. I was on a call with uh, long-term care facilities the other day. They don't have enough masks and PPE. They just don't. And so I get it that people don't have and therefore it is hard on them to protect themselves. But we don't, we don't have them for enough for the hospitals, for the nursing homes, for individuals, for the firefighters. Um, and if I'm sounding a little frustrated, I am a little frustrated. So before you meet with the businesses, before you meet with the developers, focus on the primary folks who are being underserved the most. That's what we need a demonstration of from the city council and the mayor. We need to see who your priority is. Who are your constituents? Who do you serve the most? We don't need it to be symbolic. We need to have something in our hands. So I'm asking, what can you do, sir? Well, Maurice, why don't you look at the legislation we adopted? Because what I'm hearing and what you just said is, I shouldn't meet with developers at all. Let me point out, I'm meeting with you, and I believe there are 90 participants on this call. Uh, I will meet with anybody. And, and don't read, it, it is not right for you to criticize that any elected official meets with anybody. The question is, what are we doing? We passed legislation to help individuals to expand at the cost of millions and millions of dollars from our unemployment insurance fund, unemployment insurance for workers. We have, we struggled to find money for undocumented who are not eligible for un unemployment insurance. Uh, we have uh, prohibited evictions. We've done a number of things for individuals. We've also done some things for businesses. Um, look at what we passed and, and speak to that because that is, what, um, that is what speaks to our priorities. Now, uh, um, Ambrose made a comment about where free food is available. And I urge folks to look at the coronavirus.dc.gov website. I'm looking at this map, I may be reading it wrong, but it looks like there are a large number of places relative to the rest of the city where free groceries are available east of the river. And I'd actually like uh, Ambrose to look at this, it's on the coronavirus.dc.gov website and see if I'm misreading this map because it should not be that there are fewer places where residents can get free groceries east of the river, particularly since east of the river uh, it has only two grocery stores. Right. Can I, I know we're over time. Can I jump in real quick? Yes, go ahead. Um, Chairman, I'm, and I'm glad you're here. I, I appreciate you being here. And a lot of us have been tracking the legislation. I think, you know, this is a crisis for everyone and a lot of us work in or are in communities that are always in crisis so they just continue to get piled on by people who are now feeling that weight and that's where this passion is coming from it's not we're not saying like you're not doing anything this is where i'm saying. we're not saying that the council's not doing anything we know that people are moving it's just a matter of in what order and who is being prioritized and so what we're seeing is we're not seeing mutual aid networks get the money and that might not come from you 
that might come from the mayor. But the council has a lot of sway when it comes to stuff like that. Like, we are not sitting in positions of power like you. And so I think that's where this is coming from. We're trying to raise these issues right now because this is, this is it. I mean, this is our opportunity to do that. And so I think that's where that's coming from. I, I wanted to ask one of the questions that I've seen, and I hope this is okay, just because I've seen it raised like three or four times in the chat box. Um, people are asking, based on Reggie's comments, how can the DC government start moving people into hotels being quarantined into housing? And how can the DC government expedite people moving off the street and out of shelter into housing? I'm not sure I understand the question. If what you're asking is whether we could essentially empty the shelters and move them into hotels, uh, I don't have the answer to that. Um, and it's something I could, ask of the, I could ask of the executive. The question is, after they're moving, I think it's a two-step plan. So how do you move people into hotels and then how do you move them from the hotels into housing instead of having them cycle back into the shelters? Doesn't that speak more to just the fundamental problem that we have with our um, homeless shelter system that uh, we've always had more people in the shelter system uh, than we are getting out of the system and we need to increase the, um, the exiting from, from the shelter system. I don't know that in an emergency we can solve that any more quickly than we did before the emergency. And that doesn't mean that we were doing it right before the emergency. I have not had direct oversight over homelessness in several years. When I did, I know that it was very much an issue. What can we do to improve exiting and improve exiting in a way that actually works? Uh, for instance, uh, rapid rehousing, in my view, has been overused, misused, and it doesn't work for a lot of folks. So we want exiting that works. I don't want to say that we were doing it right, but if we were struggling to solve that problem before the emergency, I don't see that we will solve that problem during the emergency. Uh, to me, the bigger issue is what do we do, I shouldn't say the bigger, the immediate issue is what do we do to prevent the pandemic from spreading way out of control in a congregate setting such as a shelter? Um, and I, I'm not sure we're doing enough there either, but I think that's really the challenge is, the immediate challenge is, what can we do to, uh, what should we be doing more of to prevent the spread of the virus in a congregate setting like a shelter where we know that there is a higher number of folks who have, um, what is it, comorbidity issues and therefore at greater risk if they get the uh, virus. Before, yeah, thank you for uh, that. Um, Caitlin, let me, let me plug in here because um, we're, we're basically past time. Um, but I did want, I know Reggie has a question, but I wanted to ask one question to the, the chairman, uh, going back to the comp plan, is, is there anything from what we're seeing with COVID-9 that has come to light that would change or cause changes to what we're doing in the comp plan as we look into the future? I mean, has anything triggered to you that said, oh, we need to go back and address this a little more strongly in our plans so that we're better prepared uh, for the future? Have anything I, hit you yet? With I think that's a good um, My answer, I don't know that I'm correct on this, is generally no. Um, as I said before, the plan, the real teeth of the plan are in the land use section. And uh, uh, there, there, is, there is or should be a um, health or public health element to the plan, but we need to have a better plan for dealing with a pandemic emergency like this. Right. Nobody expected, nobody expected that there would be a uh, public health emergency like this. I thought when I was reviewing the council's uh, emergency plan, it's COOP, uh, which I did in February, I was thinking of something like anthrax, you know, where you see a number of employees who are um, disabled and how do we continue operations? Not where at the council, nobody was disabled, but we are staying at home. Um, so we haven't done the right planning, but the comp plan is not the place for that. Uh, the comp plan is not where one goes to see the uh, con continuity of operation plans or the pandemic plan. There needs to be a better plan. 
Uh, but I would say that's separate from the comp plan. I see Ambrose raising his hand. I just have, I just, let, let's go, before you go, let, let's get Reggie and then Ambrose and then we'll, um, right. um, we'll go as long as the chairman is willing. Okay. So, so, so my, 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 uh, my question um, is kind of big piggybacking on Caitlin's point. So would you consider creating something to deal with that emergency uh, basis on certain entities that may have a certain level of vacancies? Um, for example, some of the folks that you may have met with, I think their name is DC 2021, and they have a substantial amount of like tax relief already. Uh, I believe one of those players had $30 million, I believe it was a wharf project. So in terms of the emergency, um, would you be willing to make that, you know, a requirement if they want to have something on the relief side from you, do they have to fill their vacancies right now? Their vacancies like, uh, what kind of vacancies? So the Office of Planning has research that talks about over 10,000 units um, that were built in the city were vacant as far as we know and those vacancies haven't been filled. So if we have these large conjugal settings and we have actual vacant rental units and these people are getting some sort of financial incentives or relief, why aren't we requiring them to fill those vacancies? Well, first of all, I don't know the accuracy of the 10,000 figure. I just don't know. Um, I don't know whether it's long or that's just the uh, actual turnover vacancies in the course of turnover. I can agree that every landlord in the city now would like to have income producing property. And so if there are vacant units, residential units or commercial units, I can't think of a landlord who wants to sit on it being empty. Um, the, um, you know, I, I think I, a number of people on this call, I think are resenting that council members heard from developers. As I said before, I, am, I have an open door to everybody and I wanna hear from everybody. I don't know what kind of relief, if any, we're gonna be able to provide to the business community. I do know this, that when a restaurant is closed, it's not employing anybody. And if a restaurant is open, then there are jobs. So there's an importance to having businesses open as well as ensuring that individuals are able to pay their rent and make their debts and buy food and basically live, everybody is struggling here, or almost everybody is struggling here. Um, and I don't know what this, I, you know, we're struggling to find the right solutions. Um, I'm not sure if that is answering your question, but I think part of your question was, well, will we require something in return for relief? I don't even know at this point if we can provide any additional relief to the business community. Uh, but I can tell you that to the extent that we're interested in relief to the business community, we want to see jobs in return. Uh, Ambrose, and then uh, I don't know how much time you have, Chairman, but uh, we'll... How about if we give it till 3.30, if that's okay with you? Uh, that works with us. All right, Ambrose. So um, first, I just want to thank you, Mr. Chairman, for, for coming um, and, and appearing and, and sharing with us. Uh, I have a question and then a comment. The question centers around the budget. And, uh, you know, there is 500 million that's allocated by the federal government, uh, which shortchanged the District of Columbia because they counted this as a territory. And there is some discussion about um, uh, including in the next round on the federal side, the extra 750 million. But my question is about whether or not that money or any of that money, whether or not the 500 now or um, the uh, 700 million that is coming can be used to replenish our rainy day fund? That's the first question. Um, the second is, is a comment getting back to looking towards the future. So one of the things that can happen when we talk about jobs, when we talk about uh, all these uh, disparities and social determinants, one thing that the comp plan can affect, for example, it can create industrial zones in Ward 7, Ward 8, where uh, Ward 8, Ward 7 residents, returning citizens, and the homeless can work to produce PPE. We can't do it now because it's too, you know, it, 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 we're in the moment right now. 
but looking in the future, ESLBD and DEMPED can create the atmosphere in which uh, people in Ward 7 and 8 can be employed producing medical equipment like PPE just for the current status and need of PPE, but particularly for the future in case this happens again. These are the kinds of ideas that I'm talking about that we need to be thinking about in terms of future development as it does relate to the comp plan. So I just want you to comment on that. And, and then, yes, I know that the council can, you know, they have their bucket in which they can do things during this crisis. And then much of this really is on the mayor and her team. So I understand that. I understand the limitations, but there are some things that I just wanted to get some answers in terms of use of federal dollars. Well, it's an interesting um, observation, Ambrose. The, um, you know, we need PPE desperately right now. Uh, the comprehensive plan isn't going to have any changes in it until later this year. We, I hope, I'm assuming we won't need PPE next year. On the other hand, industrial land allows for manufacturing and having the capability for manufacturing allows for things to happen. I mean, who would have thought the Ford Motor Company and G GM would be manufacturing ventilators instead of cars? Uh, so there's something to be said for having industrial land. Um, Ambrose, if I could, I would hug you right now because very few people talk about industrial land. And in fact, if anything, they want to reduce the amount of industrial land in the city. That's right. You know, we had a fight in the council. Maybe it wasn't much of a fight, but I wasn't real happy about it. Um, this had to do with um, whether a, med a medical marijuana cultivation facility could locate on Pennsylvania Avenue on the railroad track side, because that was zoned industrial. This was horrible. And so there was a, a move to prohibit um, a, a um, growing center on Minnesota Avenue, which I didn't really think of as manufacturing, but it was classified as manufacturing. And that's because people don't like um, manufacturing or industrial zone land. So um, I, I happen to believe we need industrial land in the city and that we need to stop looking at it as a low cost option for more office or more residential or more whatever, um, and that we need to preserve it. Um, but I had not thought of the angle that you're mentioning, which is that then we would have the capacity to step up and do more of what we need right now. You know, Compass Coffee is manufacturing hand sanitizer? Mm. Yes. Yes. With this emergency, they've yeah. converted to a hand, make, making hand sanitizer. Yeah. Well, not converted, but they're making hand sanitizer. Mm -hmm. Um, I have a few questions from the chat. What about the use of federal dollars for our, to, to replenish our surplus? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I don't think we can use federal dollars to replenish our surplus. Uh, one of the issues that we've been debating is whether we can use the federal dollars for tax relief. Um, I emphasized before, we are dipping into our reserves right now. And, and as I'm sitting here, I do not know how much we have spent, but I am guessing that it is in uh, probably in the hundreds of millions of dollars mm -hmm. we are or will be in the next month spending from our, our reserves. We will be getting a revised budget for the current fiscal year because our revenues have dropped by over $600 million. Mm -hmm. And the CFO has preliminarily indicated that our budget will drop uh, roughly $600 million in each of the next several fiscal years. Um, that's a real hit on us. And as I said before, because the chief financial officer has been participating in phone calls with CFOs from other cities and other states. The program that I want to look at whether we can access it that would allow us to borrow money at low cost from treasury and not have to pay it back for two years. There's some question whether we could do that, whether the district could do that. It was put in the CARES Act because there were a half dozen states that we're looking at um, being non-liquid, uh, being close to insolvency uh, in the next month or so. The, our chief financial officer tells me that there are cities that the ability of fully understanding what their problem is because they don't control all of their revenue, a lot of it comes from the state, and that those cities are 
probably going to be insolvent because mm -hmm. of the, the loss of revenues. We are not facing that situation. Uh, Chairman, one of the questions from the chat going dealing with the budget is um, we're talking about cuts likely coming both for this fiscal year and into next fiscal year. Um, do you have a sense of where those cuts are likely to hit? And um, yeah, where those cuts are likely to hit? What's the, what's the dynamics at play at this point? As I'm, as I'm saying, no, I don't have a sense. Um, the 600 million this year is a, in some ways a harder nut to crack than $600 million next year because we have less than half a year to solve. On the other hand, we had a $500 million surplus at the end of last fiscal year. And uh, so uh, that would be a place to look. Another place to look would be where we put cash rather than borrowing in our, in our capital improvement plan. Um, so those are, those are possibilities. Uh, there may also be some refinancing that the chief financial officer has not done, or actually there were some savings that from refinancing that he did earlier this year that might be available to help with this fiscal year. Um, I did a quick look at the, our budget. Our budget this year, if you take 600 million out, what does that look like? Well, it looks like what we spent in FY18. Uh, so if you think of it that way, it doesn't have to be devastating. It means some reworking so that we're spending what we spent uh, two years ago. And then procedurally, is that something we're waiting for the mayor to initiate? Or how does that work in terms of the current budget year and the cuts and et cetera? Is that something coming from the executive or is that something council does? And how do we influence that process? I'm glad you um, the, um, by law, the council cannot introduce a budget, so it comes from the mayor. Uh, once she introduces, as you know, we have a, a process with public input, and then we make some changes and adopt a final budget. The, um, the mayor was supposed to submit her budget March 19th. We extended that date or moved that date to May 6th, and at this point, we're going to move that date to May 12th. Uh, I'm assuming that the council will still be, the city will still be at a, a stay at home uh, in May, the month of May. So what we're looking at is what will be the process for having public hearings uh, on a Zoom platform or WebEx platform. Um, we can do it. It probably will be a significantly scaled back process. What I'm looking at in terms of the committee as a whole is that um, we would have fewer hearings than we've had in the past. The hearings would be shorter, that we would encourage much more written testimony, uh, that the hearings would have to be more carefully managed. So instead of having um, pick a group uh, that comes and testifies and then has five other people from that group testify, maybe only one person from that group testifies. I think it's important that we have the public input. Um, we will probably get from the mayor two, we call them supplemental budgets. The supplemental budget is revision to the current year budget. I expect we'll get two supplemental budgets, one that we will adopt immediately, and the other we will adopt at the same time that we adopt the fiscal year 2021 budget. The fiscal year 2021 budget, um, we will probably vote, I believe, uh, possibly July 7th and July 21st. So I guess to that process, the council session would likely not be extended into the summer that you all would try to crunch everything down into the shortened period. If we, um, if we get the budget May 12th and the final vote is July 21st, that would be the same period. The only thing that would be different is that the hearings would be more uh, carefully managed and uh, streamlined. Instead of an education committee hearing with 140 witnesses, it's probably an education committee hearing with 20 witnesses. Um, there will still be the same amount of time, however, for the public to comment. Um, 
we have to be mindful that there is a deadline on the other end, and that is that we have to have a budget in place by October 1st. All right, any other panel questions or yeah. things in the scroll that I've missed? So we have, I think, eight minutes. If I could get a question in real quick. Okay. So again, thank you so much for everyone for being here. I did want to reiterate one uh, scientific fact and then ask a real question. Uh, right now, I'm just reading a study, another epidemiology study in the New York Times, and 90% of the deaths in the U.S. were preventable. And so we have enough data to show that actually all of this was completely preventable. Was this predictable? Absolutely. People have done studies on this. Pandemics are not new. There was a U.S. task force, which was um, gutted. Uh, and again, it's not one person or one council which was responsible, but the fact being that we didn't need to be here. I also wanted to point out that there's enough evidence to show that lack of equitable resource is, is, is also responsible for what is happening and what will continue to happen in, in the future. Now, my quick question is, knowing all of this, we are also, by the way, we haven't seen the worst. Things are actually going to get much worse. Um, and let's keep that in mind. Not according to Donald Trump. <laughs> yeah, exactly. uh, and uh, I think the question really is that can we, can you enact a legislation which can make sure that this COVID recovery fund, and this is a question from the chat, can be proportionately distributed to the people who need it the most, right? Because there isn't an infrastructure east of the river. And so the one hospital which has not been funded and uh, no grocery stores and all that kind of stuff. Is there legislation which is in your power and hand which can make sure that these funds can be allocated equitably? I'm not sure what that means. It sounds good, but I'm not sure what it means in reality. Uh, you know, some of the dollars in the federal, the federal dollars, and that's what you're asking about, are dedicated to uh, hospitals, uh, some to um, the, um, I believe, to the hotel sector, to the airline sector. Of course, we don't have airlines in the district. Um, so a lot of the money goes that way. The, um, what I think we have to do is to the extent that we are able to help individuals, that um, we are, we're mindful of, um, I guess I would say the disparity of need. I'm saying it a little bit differently than you. Um, I recognize that uh, unemployment insurance, for example, is a proportion of one's income. It's their ordinary income. There's a camp. So a person who earns $200,000 a year or $500,000 a year, it's the same maximum as somebody who earns, I think it's like 100000 a year in terms of the, the cap. But I'm also mindful that unemployment insurance for those who are low-wage workers is not very much money, and it's less than what they were earning, which was not enough. And uh, so that's the reason why I think that the $600 a week supplement from the federal government is important. That really makes it possible that folks who are struggling to pay their rent are in a better position than they would be without that $600 a week supplement. Thank you. I, I think you're getting to what I was talking about. Like $100 billion for hospitals was taken. Can we on a city make legislation that those, whatever DC is going to get from those billions of dollars can go specifically to a hospital which has been defunded east of the river? That's just an example. Can we have a checkpoint that X amount of money being given to the city for this particular administration like hospitals it goes not to already the uh, hospitals uh, the west of the river, but to where we actually need it the most, as an example, and then I'll go that side. But yes, you were well, on. Yeah, I think there's only one hospital east of the river. There is only one hospital east of the river. And uh, we adopted legislation to remove that control board trigger for their overspending. Uh, you know, they, they're not, they're very badly managed. And uh, so we put a trigger in place a year ago that if they overspend their budget, that they, um, we would bring in a control board and basically take over the management. Uh, we removed that trigger, recognizing that right now they need more resources. Uh, I expect that they will get more resources. You know, one of the problems with UMC, there's not a good clinic system associated with that hospital. And the best way to treat folks, you know this better than me, is primary care rather than waiting for them to show up at the ER at, uh, at UMC. Um, we're not going to be able to fix that healthcare system east of the river in the next couple of months when we've been struggling to do it. But if your question is about these additional federal resources, um, yes, I, I think we're going to see more money going to uh, UMC. Uh, to piggyback on, on that question, I guess specifically 
there's been talk about the 500 million coming from the federal government. Um, that DC is allotted like a territory. What are the strings on those dollars? And then some of the questions are asking, can that be targeted for people below 30% AMI or things like that? Can we begin to attach, attach strings to dollars or pool of dollars like that that are coming from even federal or even emergency funds that we extend locally? Are we able to better target those funds and do that up front so people and infrastructures know that those dollars are coming? Uh, for one, the distribution of the dollars, whether we're talking about individuals or businesses, uh, housing, whatever, um, in this emergency, because we're talking about urgency, we have to work through existing processes. So a way to get dollars to individuals is through unemployment insurance, rather than our creating a new system. This was actually one of the problems with the proposal that the council did not consider, which was to create a parallel unemployment insurance fund for undocumented workers. We'd have to set up a whole new system. We don't have time for that. We have to find another mechanism to help individuals, undocumented workers. So we're going to have to work through existing processes in order to, to get out the help. In terms of what strings are attached to the 500 million, uh, I don't think any of us fully know at this point. We just know that the amount of assistance to the district has got to be at least what the smallest states are getting. Now, there are a number of different pots, like the CARES Act for, um, adds money to the CDBG um, allocations that the district gets. Uh, and that's just to, to illustrate that there are a number of pots that are getting additional dollars. But there was this one fund which was a minimum uh, to the states of at least 1.25 and we got only 500 million because we were treated as a territory. And we're hoping to get that increase to the 1.25. That doesn't answer your question what the things are because I don't know. So I guess, so we're about ready to wrap up. It's um, 3.30. Um, but to, to wrap that up, to wrap that line of questioning up, and I think that's our biggest concern here, is that we really know we're in an emergency, but we feel there's a way to leverage the emergency to help with our long-term needs. And some of that can happen if we ensure that any funding in the emergency is leveraged in a way that is targeting the places that were at a deficit or inequitably dealt with prior to the emergency. And so I think that's our general question and that's, we really would like to know how do we make sure that the council, the mayor understands that that is our position and that, um, you know, we figure out ways to make it happen and where it can't, it can't, but where it can, it does happen. Well, I think we can deal with underlying problems, that would be great. Uh, but I will go back to the emergency metaphor, which is not just a metaphor, it's a reality. And in an emergency, you have to triage. So the, the first thing first is to deal with that uh, hospital surge and to deal with the folks who are getting no income, who were getting income before, and the businesses that are getting no income and we want them to be able to reopen so that they can bring back the jobs. So I think we have to be, um, we have to remember that we have to triage in an emergency, although the goal that you, you are setting forth, William, it, if we can do it, and that is to make some progress on the underlying um, inequities, uh, we, that would be great. All right, so I think we're going to, we appreciate your time, Mr. Chairman, and um, we're going to close down now. It's 3.30. Uh, the panelists, uh, those who have been chatting, we will understand that the video will be made available on demand for later for people to look at. Um, would you that, mind if, excuse me? Video on demand, is that pay-per-view? It will be. <laughs> uh, as long as you allocate money to the proper fund in the budget, you, you'll be able to access it. Um, so we'll make that um, 
we would like to send you a few of the questions that may have come up on the chat that maybe you can answer in writing if you have time would you be willing to do that uh, i can try okay all right uh thank you all um we're going to wrap up now and i think we'll be announcing another meeting we do this monthly at least so hopefully we'll announce a new date and hopefully we'll do some other things uh so thank you all thank you Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Chairman Mendelson. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Thank you. Oh, man. Oh, man.